Welcome to another Hardware News Recap. This week we're talking about Intel's unveiling of their discrete GPU, which is still probably several years away, but they have a prototype that they just showed off at an IEEE conference. I'll also be talking about some Intel accidentally leaked CPUs on Newegg. Oops, that include the G4900 series, G4900, G4920. And we've got some news on uh, AMD components, on a Windows upgrade and on a cryptocurrency security vulnerability in one of the popular wallets for any of you who use those. And we've got a couple of other things as well. Before we get into that, this video is sponsored by Dollar Shave Club, makers of the new $5 shave shower shave starter set. The kit includes the Dollar Shave Club executive razor bearing the heft of any high quality tool and also includes reloadable cartridges. The $5 kit includes everything you see on the screen now, like the body wash and shave butter, and can be refilled for a few dollars a month. This deal is available for $5 exclusively using our link below or dollarshaveclub.com slash gamersnexus. Let's start out with some GN site news. We published a PUBG graphics analysis and frame rate benchmark for the Xbox One X. So even though this is a console, we think a lot of you would be interested in this because it specifically uses some new software that we developed for frame rate analysis that we can apply towards PC in the future. And we also do some technical explanations as to different types of graphics anomalies that we saw. Like for example, when the normal maps were glitching out at glancing angles underneath the parachute, or when we talked about static versus dynamic particle mesh replacement on some of the fences and how their scaling was wrong. So it may interest some of you, if only from a graphical, a technical graphical standpoint, but we are moving some of this technology towards our PC benchmarking in the future at some point. So check that out. It's on the channel if you're interested. Starting us out, Intel published some slides at an IEEE conference. It was the IEEE Solid State Circuits Conference, and this primarily highlighted a prototype 14 nanometer discrete GPU that the company is working on for the distant future. This model uses a multi-chip approach to graphics processing. It's a prototype for now, which means that you can't derive anything from it. We don't know if it's gonna be low end or high end, consumer or AI, we have no idea at this time. But uh, it is a functional prototype and it's the first thing that Intel's shown in the discrete GPU region since they hired Raja Kadori and actually since many years before that. So this is probably not a product that Kudori had much hand in at all because he is a recent hire and it takes a long time to make these things. But uh, we do suspect to see more of his influence going forward as Intel continues to work on its discrete GPU division, which he is now a part of. Of note, Intel's IEEE slide shows a complete graphics system, as they call it, has a 14 nanometer silicon component, which contains a low power GPU, a system agent component, and a configuration and debug path. This is mounted to an FPGA board, which then communicates via PCIe to the host, and the test chip is sized at just eight millimeters by eight millimeters, making it clear again that this is a very simple prototype. It also totals 1.54 billion transistors in that area, so we can't really derive much from it other than they're showing off some of the basic capabilities. The GPU voltage is regulated through an integrated voltage regulator, similar to the fiber of Intel CPU architectures, for the prototype, frequency is operating at 50 megahertz or 0.51 volts, or 400 megahertz or 1.2 volts. One of the main focal points for Intel's presentation was on faster turbo to unturbo transitions, which will theoretically aid in limiting power consumption, and then we'll have more on this later, probably a couple years. It'll be a while before this makes it to any kind of market. But they've got a prototype, so that's kind of exciting to see another vendor get into the GPU space. We'll see what part of the space they compete in, ultimately but it'd be nice to see more choice, at least in consumer, although they're probably targeting something like AI and enterprise first. On the topic of Intel, this is a quick one. A few new Coffee Lake S CPU SKUs were accidentally posted early to Newegg, including an unintentional reveal of the forthcoming G-Series Pentium CPUs. These include the G900 and G920, which were previously mentioned, but not detailed. These are theoretically based on Newegg's listings, priced at around $52, for the G4900 and $66 for the G4920. We know the G4900 will be a two core, two thread CPU with two megabytes of L3 cache, and the G4920 will run the same specs, though presumably with a different frequency. There are rumors out there for the frequencies, but nothing's been confirmed yet. And meanwhile, the i5-8500 and i5-8600 non-K CPUs were also posted early, both of which will run six core, six thread configurations 
with nine megabytes of L3 cache. One more Intel adjacent story before moving on to AMD components. This is about Gigabyte's Z370 Ultra Gaming Motherboard. It's a board that we've lamented since we got it. It's, it's really, it was okay, but it was never a very good overclocker. It had some other issues. It had coil wine issues that were more noticeable than on other platforms or other products. So since the launch of Z370, Gigabyte's been working on revising that board and now they have an Ultra Gaming 2.0 coming out. So this is a completely new version. It's not just a revision of the existing Ultra Gaming, it's actually Ultra Gaming 2.0. And the changes include primarily an increase in the phase count, they're going from seven total phases to 11 with the new version, and they're also improving a couple of other things. So for example, a few of the additional changes include uh, an extra M.2 heatsink towards the top, and uh, more importantly, better chokes that should be useful for theoretically reducing coil whine that we observed in the earlier model. Price will land at around $160, not a huge change in price, and the name is officially Ultra Gaming 2.0 if you're looking for it. These changes should help address some of our initial concerns, although the heat sinks on the VRMs really aren't any better than previously, but the rest of the concerns are at least getting something of a look. In liquid cooling news, EK has announced a socket TR4 monoblock compatible with two MSI X399 motherboards. These include the Gaming Pro Carbon AC and the SLI Plus boards. The cold plate covers the entire Threadripper IHS and cools the VRMs also. And from pictures, it appears that the fin area does completely cover the CPU dies this time. So this was a bit of a misstep from EK previously, where the first Threadripper block didn't have enough microfins to cover even the, the die surface area on the CPU. So they revised that. This monoblock covers more of the surface area of the CPU. It covers the entire die area and should cool better overall. Also of note, uh, it does look like the block contains a removable RGB LED strip, if that's something you're into, and it's compatible with MSI's Mystic Lite software. And then pricing, it's looking like 126 euros or about 140 USD. This one's short and is from Microsoft. There's a new power mode in Windows, at least for Windows insiders using Windows 10 Pro for workstations. And that mode is called Ultimate Performance Mode. It'll soon be available for those on the Windows Insider path and it's designed to, quote, eliminate micro latencies associated with fine-grained power management techniques. This is specific to the workstation and enterprise editions of Windows 10 for now, and we don't know if it'll come out for desktop or if it's even necessary, but if it does, we'll certainly benchmark it. For purposes of our benchmarks, if you're curious, we typically use the high performance power plan, unless we specifically state otherwise for some other reason like testing power saving or something like that. But uh, for high performance, you do want the high performance power plan. However, it does obviously use a bit more power than would typically be necessary for low load scenarios. For workstation users though, now you'll have another one and workstations don't really care as much about power anyway. This one is some security news. Our colleagues over at TechGage have discovered a security vulnerability in the Jax cryptocurrency wallet, which they've detailed fully in their article at techgage.com. The article goes on to demonstrate that the Jax wallet creates a cache folder on the host system, which can then be copied and pasted to any other computer with the Jax wallet software. Without requiring any sort of password at all, this cache folder can then be copied to the new location, used to access the currency stored in the wallet, and then the attacker could send that currency to a different wallet. There's an optional four digit pin code as well that they don't require you to turn on, but you can do it through software options. And from what we understand, it's bypassable through other security exploits. And either way, four digits gives you about 10,000 combinations to attempt to crack anyway, even if you weren't using exploits to circumvent the code. As TechGage shows in their video, it would be trivial for a user with access to the PC to copy this cache folder and send its currency to another wallet. One instance of such an exploit might be a PC repair technician who has physical access to the PC and therefore can grab the folder and access it later. Alternatively, something like Meltdown or Spectre would make sense here, as they can use side channel attacks to gain access to memory and can be executed via hijacked ad network JavaScript without ever requiring physical access to the computer, just remote access. TechGage details the exploit further in their own content, 
which we've linked in our show notes for this episode found below in the description. Also note our other colleagues at Hardware Unboxed posted a video talking about Intel scalability under different thermal conditions. This is close to home for us because we run all of those case thermal benchmarks where we can show throttling in some instances. And in Hardware Unboxed testing, they look at the stock Intel cooler with a couple of other coolers to see how turbo is affected under various thermal circumstances. And for that, again, you can find a link in our show notes below. For another security news item relating back to kind of the Meltdown Inspector stuff from a moment ago, Intel is expanding its bug bounty program as a consequence of the Meltdown and Spectre exploits. It's an invitation-only program that was launched in March 2017, only a few months before they were notified of Meltdown. Now the program is open to all security researchers and bounties are being raised across the board, up to $100,000 in some areas and up to $250,000 in other areas with a temporary program specifically focused on side channel vulnerabilities like Meltdown Inspector. The intent is to encourage, quote, coordinated disclosure, or in other words, make sure Intel is the first to know. As rough as the past few months have been, it looks like Intel knows that they dodged a bullet by having Google Project Zero discover this and report vulnerabilities to them first. And finally, following EA's Star Wars Battlefront 2 debacle, which came between EA's Battlefront 1 and Visceral Games shutdown debacles, the rumor circulating now is that Lucasfilm and Disney are looking for a new studio to develop the Star Wars license. The source for this specified rumor is an article from Cinelinks, which cites Ubisoft and Activision as possible contenders, but doesn't offer much else in the way of concrete statements. Regardless, EA stock prices have continued to rise higher than ever before with the reintroduction of microtransactions to Battlefront 2. So it's clear just how far speaking with your wallet goes when it comes to EA. Battlefront 2, they did note, performed exceptionally poorly versus the expectations given the whole microtransaction fracas of sorts from last year, but they've reintroduced them. So uh, that's what EA thinks of us all. But either way, it's possible that the license may be taken away from them. So we'll keep an eye on that. It's all just rumor right now. But that's it for this one. As always, you can check the link to, in the description below to the article containing show notes for this news episode, which will have sources and things like that if you'd like to read further on any specific topic, including those items from our colleagues at various websites. So subscribe for more, as always, to catch next week's episode. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up a shirt like this one or one of our GN mugs that we just restocked. Get that out of here. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.